everybody, it's Mazzy here. So, um, Memories of a Vinyl Junkie, 1966. Now this video, I was, I was gonna say it's gonna be a little different, but it's, it's more the same. So it'll go on as long as it uh, needs to be. 1966 was a, big, was a transitional year for music, and for me personally, uh, I was 11 to 12 years old. Turned 12 in August of that year. So that's going from, in the, in the States, going from sixth grade to junior high school, where things really change in junior high school, because instead of having one teacher all day, you have various classes, as you know, various uh, different teachers for music, for math, for science, for social studies, for humanities. If, did we have humanities in? I'm not quite sure. So we're going to go 1966, and um, really important year. I was studying, studying, taking drum lessons in the beginning of that year. So um, that's what I was doing in the sixth grade. In the seventh grade, that summer, I met Larry. Larry would become my lifelong friend and drummer. And my friend Larry um, passed away about seven years ago. And uh, the drum set, uh, set that you've seen in some of my videos, or at least in the environment down here in my office, and music room, uh, his wife gave me when I moved from San Francisco to Seattle. So this video is for you, Larry. Uh, I miss you dearly. Larry and I were both in the fall of 1966, got into the uh, junior high school orchestra. And we were both in the back the entire time because we were both drummers. I was mostly playing the timpani. He was playing the bass drum and some snare parts. It wasn't a, a, a jazz band or a stage band, so we didn't have the full drum set. It was more orchestral. So I was doing the timpani thing. I loved playing the timpani then. But I was taking drum lessons. And I would learn my paradiddles, my flamadiddles, my triplets, which I can't play anymore. But that's how it all started. In between, though, that summer, I went to see my friend in Woodside, California, who I would spend uh, a week with in Woodside. He'd come up to San Francisco and stay with me for a week. And he taught me a few guitar chords. And I fell in love with the guitar. Larry and I, in that end of that summer, into the early fall, wanted to start a band together. Even though I was still taking drum lessons, I switched to guitar. I had just a snare drum. I never had a full set. I had a snare drum for my drum lessons. <laughs> and I switched to guitar. So Larry and I started a band. That was the first real band. We'll talk about that later. So I'm talking about records from 1966. There'll be some spillovers from 65 to 67, just because that's the way I fly here. And that's uh, a really important part of the music. Um, I'm going to start off just with a really quick funny off the beat novelty record. I was homesick uh, one day and I, my mother was going uh, to the store to pick up some things and she asked me if I wanted something from the record store, which is right next door or in the same mall as the market. And I did want a specific single that became a novelty single, which I love that came out in 1966. And that is Warner Brothers Records, they're coming to take me away, ha ha. The B-side is the exact same song, um, backwards. So, by Napoleon the 14th. <laughs> the crazy Napoleon the 14th. Um, was it Jerry Samuels, I think was his real name. It was a really novelty record. So, I'm just throwing that out there at the beginning. But the big thing about 1966 uh, for me was the big transition from 45 to albums. Up until that point, as, as I said before, my first album was Meet the Beatles or the Bugs, the Bugs, that Liverpool sound, uh, which is uh, described in an earlier video I've done. But Meet the Beatles, Beatles second album, Beatles 65, The Early Beatles, A Hard Day's Night. The only albums I was buying were Beatle records, Beatle albums. The only albums I was buying was Beatle albums. Everything else was 45. 1966 was that transitional year that even though I continued buying 45s through the 60s, I started getting non-Beatle records. 
And I'm gonna go a little out of order here because I have a special pile here or a, a pile that I'm gonna show. In January of that year, the first non-Beatle record I got was this one, Paul Irvin Raiders, Just Like Us. And I started learning to play the song Just Like Me, which I loved on here. Such a great, uh, great sort of garage song. So Paul Irvin Raiders, this, Midnight Ride, um, and Spirit of 67 all came out uh, in 1966. And that was my introduction that, I, mean, I don't remember us calling it garage rock then. Of course, 1965 is when, and you, you could even uh, argue that 64, there were things that now they put in the uh, garage rock category like Gloria uh, by them and the like. Um, but I'm gonna first show a couple of things um, but before I get into these garage rock albums, these two records, or at least the movie, The Silencers, um, Dean Martin film, which was sort of a, a, a playoff on the success of the uh, James Bond movies. Dean Martin played the character Matt Helm, a spy, a uh, womanizer. But The Silencers, I think, was the first one. Of course, The Silencers, Wrecking Crew, not to be confused with the Wrecking Crew, uh, that was a studio band in Hollywood, but a film called Wrecking Crew, The Ambushers, uh, where Matt Helm fair, and of course us 12-year-olds, uh, 11, 12-year-olds that summer, went to see this movie and we fell in love with Stella Stevens. But The Silencers would become the name of our first band. And even though late, way late in the 80s, I think 80s or so, there was a band called The Silencers, we were the first. And we'll talk about that a little later and we'll talk about that thing. But the whole garage rock single thing, um, here's a few uh, singles I just pulled for the hell of it. A big, big, big change uh, in the Beatles was Paperback Rider and Rain. This is the copy that I remember uh, walking after school to the record store, which I could walk to in about 15 minutes. And I bought this 45s. 45s were 69 cents or so at that time. Records were about $3, give or take. Two ninety nine. Um, this was a game changer uh, for the sound of the Beatles, in my opinion, and everyone's opinion. Of course, everyone thinks that, um, at least Ringo thinks, and he's right, Rain might be his uh, very best drum performance everywhere, but this single was a game changer. Also that summer, one of the biggest singles, and to me one of the greatest singles of the summer, was the Love and Spoonful, Summer in a City. Incredible. Uh, production, um, incredible record. Eric Jacobson uh, produced this record, of course, you know, the song, what an incredible singer that's exploded out of the AM radios that summer of 66. Also, I'll throw in there, The Yardbirds is a single I got over, under, sideways, down. Pretty much the reason um, Eric Clapton left because they were getting to be a pop band. What a great pop single this is. And then um, a song, I was still into the Hermits Hermits, who had come pretty much on the first round of the British Invasion in 64. No Milk Today, uh, which is a great song written by uh, Graham Goldman, who wrote For Your Love and many other pop songs and would later in the 70s go on to be a member of 10CC. And of course, there's The Kind of Hush, which is a, also a great single on MGM Records. Also, um, I started getting on the mailing list for the Fillmore and the Avalon, which would get the handbills. So I was too young, obviously, to go to these shows. In 1966, these are just several of the posters. There's a video around here that shows more of this collection. Uh, be, these are some of the shows that were at uh, the Fillmore Auditorium posters, art posters from uh, 1966 handbills. Now, getting into the whole garage uh, rock thing, I'm gonna show these first. My local radio stations, AM radio stations, were KFRC and KYA. I'm sure all of you around the country in the States had a similar, you know, battling of the AM rock stations. I preferred KYA. These came out later, but these are kind of two, there's Golden Gate Greats and there's uh, 21 Golden Gate Greats. Now, a lot of these records were marketed and put out with different branding around the country, different local stations, I know KRLA and LA, and I'm sure East Coast and Midwest stations had similar type of things. All the same songs were packaged on these. Now in this one, these are songs from 66, early from 64, 65, 66, and 67. So you, from 66, you have Hold I'm Coming by Sam and Dave, 
Knock on Wood, Eddie Floyd, Soul Limbo by um, Booker T and the MGs, Daydream, Love and Spoolful. This is the one, Long Comes Mary, which is a great uh, song by uh, the association, but also has um, I Fought the Law, Bobby Fuller Four, La Bamba, Richie Valley's Balance, A Yellow Balloon by Yellow Balloon, <laughs> and Psychotic Reaction Count Five. So again, these sort of overlap, 65, 66, 67. And then of course, uh, this is a posthumous, I mean, after the fact of the, that really kind of brought the whole idea of these garage rock things. And in the 70s, Electra put out Nuggets. This is the um, second issue that was put out by Sire Records, a reissue to cover. A great, amazing comp that Lenny K produced. And it brought these singles to a whole new audience. I'm not going to go through them all. If you don't have a version of Nuggets, you need to get it, whether it's a compact, this expanded version or this. So, I was learning how to play a lot of these simple songs. What's great, what was great about Garage Rock is not all, but most of the songs, even though they had this great sort of compressed, loud, in-your-face sound, very kind of punk before we knew what punk was, you know, 10 years before the whole punk thing, or 12 years. But it was easy to play, three chords usually. Um, but this came out the year before. Um, this is Lies by the Knickerbocker. And the reason I'm showing this, because it leads in, uh, and it's also part of the garage thing, even though this is 1965, as I recall. But the thing lies, they were, they were a New Jersey band, and everyone thought it sounded like the Beatles. Lies, that song, sounded like a, a John Lennon uh, vocal, definitely. It was so great and became, you know, a pretty modest hit. Also, um, in 1967, uh, this, it, this is a pile of garage-related rock. Now, there'll be some overlap with the regular records I show, but of course, Pardon Raiders. And what's great about this album, um, the song Hungry is on here, and the great Eric Brings Strike, and Good Thing. They made the, some of the greatest, greatest singles. Obviously, they were supplemented by the Wrecking Crew. And I don't have it here, I don't have the Midnight Ride album here, but the single, which to me was one of, also one of the best singles uh, that year is Kicks. The song uh, was originally given to the animals and the animals passed on it. And uh, it was an unusual record at the time because for 1966, as the um, psychedelic scene was sort of percolating a little bit, you know, San Francisco scene was getting going and East Coast and other areas in LA. Uh, Kicks was an anti-drug song. It was about kicking the habit. And of course, when I bought that single, I had no idea what it was about. I didn't think of it. I just thought it was Kicks so, sort of having fun. So, um, but Pardon the Raiders was a major, uh, still banned for me in 1966. And I was I started buying their records, of course. Of course, one of the great uh, singles was Hey Joe, and every band did Hey Joe, including us. We did Hey Joe, and this is the version by The Leaves. So many uh, artists did Hey Joe, including Jimi Hendrix later. Uh, but this is The Leaves album, an original copy. Uh, this was one that was later in the cutout bins uh, that I got later in the day. And of course, the other song that every garage band did was Wild Thing uh, by The Trogs. A song by Chip Taylor, written by Chip Taylor, who's the brother of James Taylor. Nobody knew that, but this song was such an amazing song. Hottest new British group on the scene today. Then let's go up, which I didn't get on the first round, but in 1966, a Seattle band. Um, of course, I've been reintroduced to this band living now in the great Northwest are the Sonics. Uh, I believe the song's The Witch, uh, which was sort of their uh, regional hit. And uh, that was on the charts. Now we did not do this album. This is a re I did that song. This is a 1998 a reissue of Sonic Boom by the Sonics. Or Boom by the Sonics. Sonics Boom. But again, that whole uh, garage rock thing. You know, there's, Plenty of channels here that'll do features on that. So I just want to go through the rest really fast here. Dirty Water, The Standells, we also did that song. Great, great song. Um, used to think when they say mug, muggers, bugglers, and thieves or something, we used to think they were singing, was it muggers, fuckers, and thieves? Of course, that's the way we sang it when we um, 
but no one was listening. No one was probably listening anyway. This is a Sunday's reissue, uh, but a fantastic garage record. Um, there was a big scene in the South Bay uh, from San Francisco and San Jose area. A lot of bands were, were coming up there uh, through 66, 67, like the Chocolate Watch Band and a lot of other bands. But the Syndicate of Sound was sort of a big uh, 65, 66, big regional hit with Little Girl. Another song we did, Hey Little Girl. Um, but a lot of these bands were doing cover songs, like they did Big Boss Man is on here. Um, is It You or Is You Ain't My Baby? So uh, another great record, Little Girl by the Syndicate of Sound. And of course, we also did Push and Do Hard. Everyone did the Seeds music. The funny thing about doing the battles of the bands in 1966 when we played junior high school in the fall that year, there were teen clubs um, at the uh, on the junior high school campus and we'd have these teen clubs on the weekends and our band was one of the rotating bands. And of course, two thirds of the song, everyone played the same song. Little Red Riding Hood by um, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, Hanky Panky by Thomas, uh, Tommy James and the Shondells, The Seeds, Hey Joe, Gloria, You're Gonna Miss Me, 13th Floor Elevator, the great Austin band, Texas band, uh, Brokey Erickson. A great, great, great single. I do have a, a 70s, a whole box set international records that issued these records originally that came out, I guess, in the late 70s, early 80s. I still have Seal, but 13th Floor Elevator, you all know it, great. Um, I'm just, this is a comp, uh, best of Tommy James and the Shondells. Of course, it crosses over all those years from 65, 6, 7, Hanky Panky, Ball of Fire, Money Money. I think we're alone on Crimson and Clover. Again, not all 66. Now, this was an unusual record, and the AM, uh, I didn't get this initially when it came out. This is a Canadian pressing I got during, last year during my uh, Canada trip. One of the first, maybe the only band from Spain that had a hot uh, top 40 hit in the States, Los Bravos, the song Black is Black. We did not cover the song, but what a great soulful 45 this was. I did have the 45 and no longer have the 45. And then, um, of course, a couple more. Uh, the Remains, uh, one of the best garage bands of 1966. Uh, obviously, all these bands we did cover, so, they're really singles bands, and the albums were not necessarily great records at the time, but still, this is a cool album. Again, another reissue. And I put this in even though it's 1967, I think, uh, since I'm talking about the whole garage scene, probably one of the most important psychedelic garage band songs. From 1967, though, so what Maslow is cheating here is I had Too Much to Dream Last Night by the Electric Prunes. And um, you all know the song, an incredible song. So, um, after the flip side, I'm going to go through some records and tell you what else went on that year. So, 1966, um, the Beatles usually put out a lot of albums in 64, 65. They seem like to have an average of like three albums a year, it seemed like. Um, 66, things started changing. The sounds of records started changing. Things were getting more, looking back on it produced, people were thinking about albums more. But of course, you know, uh, from American audiences and the uh, audiences around the world would repackage, put together collections. And of course, Capitol Records in um, the United States wanted a Beatles record. And they were working on a Beatles record. They wanted a, a record to sell um, you know, in the springtime, uh, early summer, or late, basically late spring, and they started putting together a, a comp of singles. And for however the deal was, they got George Martin to send them several songs of what the Beatles were working on of what would become their next album, Revolver. So several tracks turned up on this record yesterday and today. I remember getting this record in 1966. Of course, I would buy the Beatle records as a given. That was There was no question I wasn't going to buy Beatle records. So this comes out, a strange comp, but of course, great song that had, you know, We Can Work It Out in Day Tripper, which was uh, I had on 45. 
Um, it had Act Naturally, Yesterday We Knew from the Singles, but it had some songs that were very different and very interesting. Drive My Car, I'm Only Sleeping, Dr. Robert, And Your Bird Can Sing. The Beatles really changed, actually, 1966 for the Beatles for me started at the end of 1965 with Rubber Soul. The American Rubber Soul was a different configuration than the British one. It was more acoustic based. It, it, it didn't have uh, songs that were on this <clears throat> and on the British version. So it started out instead of with um, Drive My Car, it started out with um, I'm Looking Through You. Anyway, it had more of an acoustic, country, folky flavor. And some would argue, including myself, that the American Rubber Soul is the better album, not the way the Beatles wanted it. So you could definitely get in, in that category and think, it's not what the artists want. It's not what the artists wanted, it's what the friggin' record company would put out. And I get that. So I came out end of, uh, what did it come out, November or so, December of 65. Uh, All through 66, I was into 66, I was listening to that, but the Beatles put this out. Now, I didn't know right away, but I had read something, and I don't remember, there weren't really music magazines, the teen magazines. It might have been a newspaper article my father saw and saved for me, because I wasn't like I was reading the newspaper every day back then, that there was a different cover on this album, and of course, uh, they changed it. I had seen a picture of it. This is the infamous uh, Butcher cover, where they basically, took this and the first pressing, they slapped these over, it was recalled. Um, extremely rare, I have two copies of this. It's another story. Um, this was shrink wrapped after the fact by someone for me who worked in a record store uh, who had a shrink wrapping machine. So I got my copy. This one's kind of messed up a little bit. Um, but I didn't get this till probably around 19, oh actually 73 is when I got my first uh, actual butcher cover by my girlfriend Judy at the time. She gave it to me and wrote over the back. The other version, she wrote <laughs> birthday greetings on the friggin' record, but hey. So I had seen pictures, but I'd never seen an actual copy, I believe, until uh, the early 70s. So, which cover do you like? Um, this was our sort of uh, protest against the Vietnam War and other things. Uh, the concept was by the photographer Robert Whitaker, who had a real conceptual bent of things. So this was really important. And of course, the summer of 1966, this album comes out. And this was a huge game changer. One would argue this is, you know, the better album than Sgt. Pepper, possibly. It's my favorite Beatles album. Um, I think it's an amazing cover by Klaus Vorman in black and white. Uh, it's another one of their albums after Rubber Soul that doesn't have the name of the band on the cover. Of course, you know, there's the hype sticker here. But um, what a gorgeous record. And just for you uh, mix freaks, the mixes of the songs on these are completely different. And when you listen uh, to the different versions, like on um, I'm Only Sleeping and, and several other songs, the guitars, there's different solos mixed up. and and uh, in the mix and really different, kind of more psychedelic in this version over this version. So uh, that's a whole other thing. But um, let's go through some records. Now, some of these records I got at the time, but I've added in records that are 1966 that I got many years, not until the 70s, but they come around. Of course, Simon and Garfunkel, Sounds of Silence. This is the version with the remixed, where they actually added, uh, made, Sounds of Silence, a folk rock song that the, the producer Tom, um, Tom Wilson added bass and drums and it became a huge hit. And, Sam, and Garfunkel really kind of got back together again and the rest is history. Um, uh, you know, I talked about Gloria from, from actually 64, 65, but that was a staple of every garage band in 1966. I did not get this album at the time. I just kept buying their singles. But 1966, Van Morrison left the band anyway and kind of left them high and dry. And I think they put out records without him, which uh, to no, no real success. A lot of blues stuff, a lot of cover stuff. Uh, the great version of it's 
It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, that Van Morrison sing, which is a great cover, but I didn't get this until way after the fact as well. Friday in My Mind, again, one of the great singles. This could have been definitely in the garage band section earlier, but the Easy Beats, uh, UK band, incredible, uh, incredible single. Uh, wonderfully covered uh, in the 70s by David Bowie also. Now, a band that I always considered are way ahead of the time, although they had huge singles, I mentioned that with Summer of the City, but in 1966, Daydream came out. Beautiful, uh, almost jug band, folky, stuff that wasn't really happening yet. So this is, you could say this is like uh, like the band or Americana in a little way, but with a pop sensibility. John Sebastian's songwriting, Zal Yanoski's guitar, lead guitar playing, adding the auto harp on here. But Daydream is, what a beautiful song on here. Of course, there's a song called Jug Band Music. And um, it's just a, a great, great album and a, a great single. Again, this is one that I got. Um, I had a birthday party in 66, which would be my 12th birthday. And I was given that. And I was playing guitar, learning guitar. Um, had acoustic guitar. And my first guitar was a battle axe of a guitar my parents got me. I'm not quite sure why they gave that me. I don't, I don't remember choosing that guitar at what they gave it to me. It was a St. George and it was a friggin' battle axe. The neck was thick, the strings were really too hard to play, but my friend Tom Q started teaching me chords. I got back and I had a friend, the triumphant of us was Larry on drums. He had, uh, he had gotten, he only had a, a snare drum and a hi-hat and a ride cymbal, so he didn't even have a bass drum yet. I had the St. Jo uh, George guitar, and I don't remember what amp I had. It was high tone or, it was kind of a weird, weird ass <laughs> amplifier. Um, our friend Danny. Danny um, got a sort of an Epiphone copy. It was, uh, we all got like, a copy guitars. We weren't getting the real deal in 1966. Like every other band you hear about, they always get these funky guitars. Not many people get a Stratocaster or a Jazzmaster or, or a Hofner or, or a Ludwig set right away. But so we, we started playing and this is like literally I would say August into September of 1966 we had a band and we started playing we started playing these teen clubs and we started playing at the at the junior high school they had they had battles of the bands and we were playing and um, in fact I'm going to show you some things in a minute but um, we did we tried to do um, daydream it was a little too melodic for us to do Danny was our singer I sang backgrounds and my voice of course 66, 67, your voice is changing. Danny had the high voice, which you're gonna hear here. I had the voice, which was terrible. I never was a good singer. I always wanted to sing. I loved to sing, but I never, it's like I, I could hear when things were out of tune, but I couldn't get the pitch right. So I was playing. Funny thing is during this period of time, we never had a bass player, but we had a guy named Kirk. Kirk was our other guitar player. So we had three guitar players. Danny didn't always play guitar. He was lead singer and had a tambourine. He was like the Mickey, excuse me, the um, Davy Jones of the group from the Monkees. And I'll show you a little later why too. So um, this was happening. And of course, one of the great songs, uh, two great songs of that year, California Dreamin' and, and Monday Monday. And of course the vocal harmonies of the Mavas and Papas are just sublime. So. I'm kind of showing these records. These are sort of in order. They're released in 66. I'm not telling you exactly. I forgot what months, but I pulled them uh, in order of release, more or less. Now, don't sue me if uh, we're off base a little bit here. I didn't have this album until the 70s. I got a used copy of it, but I did have the single Woman. Woman was a, a pretty big hit for Peter and Gordon. Of course, they took, uh, they were still writing on still had a few hits here and then of course the subsequent year Lady Godiva so from 64 65 66 um you know it was people confused Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy who we still don't know the friggin' difference except that Peter um was um Peter Asher who was sister of Jane Asher who was dating Paul McCartney and Paul lived with the Asher family for a while so Paul wrote a song especially for them woman under the name Bernard Webb to see if you'd have a hit under a different name. And of course, uh, Woman was a pretty big hit. Of course, some other uh, comps 
or some other covers. Not a great album by any stretch. Again, again they were better a singles band than an album's band. Another one that I did by the single, I don't have it anymore, but I, years later I got the comp, is um, Hold On, It's I'm Coming by Sam and Dave. An incredible, incredible song, co-written by Isaac Hayes, if you did not know that, but uh, great R&B uh, on Atlantic Records from, the 19, from 1966. Of course, I kept following the Rolling Stones and I was not getting the uh, UK versions. This is the American configuration I bought. This is my... Um, this is my mono copy on London Records. Uh, the UK cover is so much superior. I didn't get it till probably around 1969 or 70. Different, slightly different track list. But Paint It Black, Stupid Girl, Lady Jane. Lady Jane is a beautiful song. And starting around this time is when uh, Jagger and Richards really um, started becoming really good songwriters. Of course, 65 Satisfaction, but they started getting more mature songwriters here. Um, and this is recorded actually in Hollywood, uh, unlike the Beatles who never recorded any of their albums in the States, uh, the Stones did. So Aftermath and Rolling Stones, of course I don't have it here, one of the great comps of that year is High Tide and Green Grass, which was kind of their singles collection, and that I had, uh, and it's a beautiful record. Another record, which I can't um, talk about in 1966 without showing, is Pet Stones. I did not get this record until the 1970s. I, I can't think. I don't think I even heard it until the 1970s. Maybe I heard "Wouldn't Wouldn't It Be Nice," but um, of course I heard uh, one of the great great singles by the Beach Boys by anybody is um, is um, "Good Vibrations." Fantastic song. Should have been on this record. They should have stuck it on the record. I know a lot of people want value for the money you buy the single. You don't want it, but. Good Vibration should have been on this record. It deserves to be. Now, some will say maybe it doesn't fit. And of course, Pet Sounds became this great classic that everyone loves. Not until even the 70s, when Paul McCartney started in his interviews talking about how that influenced Pepper and how that uh, was his, one of his favorite albums. So I'm throwing that in there. Uh, I did not get it at the time. And we did not cover any Beach Boys records. In fact, it wasn't cool. Being in Northern California, the surf thing wasn't cool. I didn't get into surf at all, except I did get the Safari single earlier of uh, Wipeout by the Safaris with Surfer Joe on the B-side. And I got some Ventures records, which had that kind of covery, surfy, twangy, Jazzmaster Jaguar guitar. But Jazzmasters and Jaguars were not cool. Stratocasters, Rickenbackers, uh, Gibsons, I guess. Uh, even that, I don't think, you know, the Epiphone, uh, which the Beatle, Epiphone, Epiphone Casino was really cool. I didn't really, you know, know about the other, like the Les Pauls and stuff. I don't even know where they were around then. I guess they were. Of course they were. With, uh, oh, you know, I don't have any, I didn't pull out. Cream, the first Cream album, 1966. An incredible record. We did I'm So Glad, uh, which is on that record. And I believe uh, Toad, we did a version of Toad because we wanted to give... Uh, Larry, a drum solo, which he deserved. Of course, this year, I had gotten Highway 61 as my first Dylan album, but this is my, still to this day, my favorite Dylan album. It became, uh, it came out in 1966. And of course, what a massively wonderful record this is. And I know a lot of people seem here not to like Rainy Day, Woman, number 12 and 35, but I think it's a fantastic record, you know. So, um, here we go. Now, things started percolating. We were playing uh, in our band, and I remember we got a chance to make a record. <laughs> Danny's father, Danny's father's name is George Walker, and you can Google George Walker. Uh, he passed away last year, and, um, or earlier this year, maybe. He was an attorney in San Francisco, a great, an amazing uh, criminal attorney. He had a friend, or someone owed him money probably, or did a trade out. They had a recording studio called Commercial Recorders. Commercial Recorders was in the South of Market area, Natoma Street. A funky three to four store building that still exists, right behind what is, where is now, what is now the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. 
but it was kind of, uh, you know, South of Market was dark and dingy, and but this is the 60s, so it wasn't like screwy, but, um, you know, it was a working class area, a lot of warehouses, a lot of uh, light industrial, manuf some manufacturing, uh, not a lot of offices. The offices were on the other side of Market Street, but South of Market was the industrial section. And in 1966, he got us about an hour of recording time at this commercial recording. This is um, what we got. This is obviously just an audio tape generic sleeve that you'd get at the time. And we basically have basically, a, a, I think they press five copies. So it's, it's really something that's not a fully commercial thing. And this is commercial recorders. Take a look at that. Natoma Street, San Francisco. And this is a silencer. So in a way, this would be like considered a test pressing. What, what, it's probably played thousands of times, so it's really funky now. We were the silencers. The song, so, the song was called Blast Off, which I co-wrote with Danny and um, TQ, Tom Q, who taught me those three guitar chords. It's basically a G, E minor, a minor D. <laughs> no chorus, no middle eight, no nothing. The A side, Danny wrote, I don't care, which is kind of punk, punk like, and I'm going to play that in a little bit here. Uh, I, there's another video early on here somewhere that plays the entire song, so you can find it somewhere on my channel. Um, 1966, this was such an exciting night. We went in there. I think we had we did a rehearsal in one take. They wouldn't let us do the takes again. And I remember in the intro and blast off, which I'm not going to play you right now. We get off beat. Larry misses the beat. We get off. But you know, we would, normal people would have done another take. This was an unbelievable time. Um, it was in the evening, and we were so excited. Danny's father took us to Joe's of Westlake Restaurant in Daly City first for an early dinner, like around 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And I remember Coca-Cola, a Coke was a dollar. A dollar for a freaking Coke? I think you could get a, Coke, a bottle of Coke for 25, 30 cents in those days. It was kind of like going to a bar, you know, drinks are more in a bar, but we didn't know that. So, and we each had two Cokes, so he was paying a dollar a piece. It's funny how the, the things you remember when you were a kid, uh, but we went there, we had dinner, we were so excited, I think we all had burgers and Cokes, and went to the recording studio. And then we had to lug our equipment up because the freight elevator was broken. And, you know, we had kind of heavy amps at the time. I I think I had, we had access, or I think we borrowed an amp. I borrowed a Pro, Fender Pro Reverb. Danny had a Super Reverb, but if you know Super Reverbs, that's a pretty big amp for a 1966 year old kid. His father was a lawyer. Big friggin' amp, guess who carried it? Moi. So we played there. I think we ran through the songs once and we played it. I don't care. And then we overdubbed uh, the background vocals. And then I don't care. I'm singing. I don't love my baby. I don't love my baby. And my my voice is breaking and it's off key. But we had such a blast. And I don't know how long it took, but we got these copies. And again, um, Larry and Danny um, are gone now. Kirk, I don't know. He, I think he's still alive, but I haven't seen Kirk in years. Danny and Larry Knight were friends uh, until the end of their lives, and we were very close friends for years and years. And in fact, when Larry remarried in 2002 or three, we had a reunion and we played this song that I have somewhere on video. And because uh, the, the band was taking a break and we were allowed to play, and we had the keyboard player uh, sit in with us, and we did I Don't Care. And it just, it was so fun all these years later doing it. So without further ado, the silencers, I don't care, 1966.
you break my car I don't care if you hit me with a ball I don't care if you poison my food I don't care if you love a dude But I don't love you no more No more I don't love you No more I don't love you No more I don't love you No more In 1966 Summer, probably the fall of 19... No, it was... It was probably a spring. It was probably a mid-season replacement. Remember mid-season replacements? So if you have a certain age on television, usually the new season would start for television in September. Don't know when this show started, but it started in 1966. And it was The Monkees. Monday nights, 7.30, NBC television. Everybody of a certain, all the kids love The Monkees, of course. In a way, it was an answer to Hard Day's Night and Help and the Beatles and everything. You know, the Prefab Four before the Prefab Four manufactured band. Uh, you can watch tons of things and documentaries and videos on the Monkees and learn the whole story, how they were put together by Bob Raffleson, a uh, producer, and um, who would later go on to make five easy pieces with Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson was also involved with the Monkees, and that's a whole other story. Um, you know the, who they are, you know what they were about. You probably know that Steve Stills auditioned and to probably to his <laughs> good fortune, didn't become a monkey. But that was a hit TV show in 1966. And this album was everywhere. This is a fantastic record. Look, and a lot, of course, it was the Wrecking Crew and the Monkey Singing, and not till, uh, I think it was Headquarters, where they really were able to kind of really write their own songs or some of their songs, or really play their own instruments. But they had some of the most incredible songwriters, Carol King, Neil Diamond, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart. They were friggin' great singles. The theme from the monkeys, of course, uh, we all loved, and I loved it too. But on "Take a Giant Step," what a great song that was! I think that's the one of the Carol King, uh, Jerry Goffin songs. Um, oh no, that uh, to, to, to "Take a Giant Step," yeah, King and Goffin, Carol King and Jerry Goffin. Um, "Voice and Heart," I want to be free. "Voice and Heart," the monkeys TV theme. Voice and Heart, one of the great singles of 1966, and still holds up to that day. And the beginning guitar riff on that, was that Glenn Campbell? I don't know, he was uh, part of the Wrecking Crew then. But Last Train to Clarksville, an incredible, incredible record. Um, Gonna Buy Me a Dog, which was sort of their, almost like a Ringo <laughs> throwaway song, but Mickey Dolan sings it here. On Cole Gems Records, we watched that show every night. The Monkees, I mean, the Monkees started selling more records than the Beatles. They topped the charts, they beat out the Beatles. But, and in fact, the Beatles and the Monkees got to be, they kind of hung out a few times. It wasn't like people were looking down on them in a lot of ways. And of course, you know, we all know that um, Davy Jones is the shortest one being 5'3", uh, five foot three inches. And the, you know, the Beatle connection here, aside from the obvious, is that on the original Ed Sullivan show, February 9th, 1964, the Beatles Sunday night on that same episode with the Beatles, there was a Broadway version of uh, a performance of the Broadway version of Oliver. And the Artful Dodger was played by a young boy, Davy Jones. So there's a little trivia there. This was a great thing. Now, the tragedy of 1966, the horrible thing in 1966, August 29th, 1966, Monday night, the monkeys would be on it. I believe they were on by then. Maybe they weren't on yet. I don't know my monkeys dates as well as I know my Beatles dates. August 29th, 1966, five o'clock, Danny, my bandmate, my friend knocks on my door. His dad, George Walker, the attorney, got two free tickets to see the Beatles that night at Candlestick Park. 
I had a drum lesson at 7.30 scheduled at, at, <laughs> uh, with my drum teacher, Art Forcade, a little chubby, kind of overweight, bald, middle-aged man who would play uh, casuals, bar mitzvahs, weddings, drummer. And he would not allow me at my drum lessons to play on a full set. It was all snare drum, paradiddles, flamadiddles, the 13 basic rudiments of drumming. He would not allow me to have the whole set until I progressed. Of course, he didn't know that a month later, September, I would quit drum lessons, switch to the guitar teacher, and that my drumming uh, days were retired, although I still played on the school uh, orchestra for that year. Danny rings my doorbell, has his two tickets. My mother comes to the door and I said, Mom, my mom, oh, he, my mom had to drive us so we couldn't get a ride because his dad was working, his mom was working. If my mom would drive us to Candlestick Park, we could go see it. My mom says, you have a drum lesson tonight at 7.30. If we don't cancel the drum lesson within 24 hours, we have to pay for it. You can go next year. That was the last year the Beatles ever toured. That was the last performance live aside from the uh, Apple Records rooftop. That was the last paid concert. Did not sell out. The Beatles at Candlestick Park, they would never tour again. The Beatles didn't come back uh, ever again to perform. I never saw the Beatles. My mother, rest her peace, is gone. Had a drum lesson. Went to Westlake. Music Center, a store uh, in Daly City, I remember, and they had some instruments there on the walls, and we'd all look at the instruments. And I saw this. I had no idea what this was, but it was cheaper than most records for a double rec. It was the price of a single record, as I recall, or not much more. And I just, it just intrigued me. What the, f what the fuck was Susie Cream Cheese? <laughs> I bought this sight. Uh, I'd never heard it sight unseen. Well, not sight. I obviously saw it. You know what this record is, if you know the mothers. I got this home and I was gobsmacked. I actually played this a lot. It was the weirdest thing I had ever heard up to that time. But um, it was avant-garde, it was bizarre, it was strange. I mean, you know this record. Can you imagine being 12 years old and hearing this for the first time? And again, it's not like being 12 years old now with all the stuff we're bombarded with. Um, it was 12 years old and there was nothing like this. <laughs> I don't remember. I, anyway, Mother's Invention. Animals this year, of course, I got to be a big Animals fan um, with their uh, hits written uh, for them. Obviously, they started out doing a lot of blues and R&B covers. What a great, uh, voice. These are uh, Eric Burton has. Very soulful English voice. Produced by Tom Wilson, who also uh, produced um, Simon Garfunkel and Bob Dylan. Don't Bring Me Down Again. Two records for 1966. Of course, they had great, great friggin' singles. Um, and by this time, I think it was uh, by this time, after this, Alan Price, a great keyboard player, you know, from the, the um, House of the Rising Sun, that riff on there had left the band, unfortunately. Uh, Yardbirds, I did not get this till year, years later, but of course I showed you over, under, side of ways down. Great kind of uh, early psychedelic, garagey, wonderful bluesy uh, masterpiece. Their most psychedelic record, Roger and the Engineer. Roger the Engineer, the Yardbirds. My favorite Birds album of all time, uh, Fifth Dimension, 1966, 5D, but of course it had the great uh, single, Eight Miles High. We weren't thinking, I wasn't thinking about drugs uh, in terms of uh, smoking pot. It wasn't really in the, in the consciousness of a 12 year old boy in 1966, even in San Francisco. You know, into 67, the whole drug thing came about, it was more ov overtly uh, in songs. I mean. We, you know, when you heard Loosen the Sky of Diamonds, even though it wasn't about LSD, we heard the rumors about that. Um, so that was an incredible too. I don't have my original uh, first album by the association, but along comes Mary. 
another song supposedly about marijuana, but that was an incredible single in 1966. Um, I bought this album because I liked Laugh Laugh. Uh, this is not a very good record, and the record company really pushed them, uh, the Bo Brummels, who were a San Francisco band, uh, really kind of pushing that whole UK look and the British invasion, even though it was two years later, and had them do, uh, I don't know all the details on the production, how they did it, but all cover songs. And it was, it's kind of a bust. You, they do, you got to hide your love away, Mr. Tamarine Man, Louie Louie, Yesterday, Bang Bang, Hang On Sloopy, Monday Monday. I'm not sure why bother, because they were great songwriters, great singers. Uh, Bo Brummel 66, bit of a novelty. Uh, produced by Tom Donahue, who had, the following year in 67, he actually had Autumn Records, uh, but they got picked up by Warner Brothers. He was to be the father of Underground Radio starting in 1967, which we don't didn't have quite yet with Underground Radio and the whole scene. That was Tom Donahue who started that. I did not, I was not really into Frank Sinatra uh, in 1966, although all over the, one of his biggest hits ever was Something Stupid. Crazy, crazy, that, that was one of his biggest hits. That year I'd also, I don't have the, I have a representation here, but I don't have These Boots Are Made For Walking by his daughter, Nancy Sinatra. Great, great um, single. But this is a great album, and of course I didn't get into this till probably 30 years ago, and that's Sinatra at the Sands. Great uh, album, great live record. I recommend anyone who likes at least some Sinatra. Live uh, recording in the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. Count Basie Orchestra arranged by um, uh, Quincy Jones. Really good, some um, colorful language in terms of um, the, the stories he tells in between songs, intros to songs, which are sort of um, not politically correct these days, but still, it's a great friggin' record. I think there are actually some audio file or releases of this too, but uh, pick this record up. This is a mono version, which isn't fantastic. I didn't have this record right away, but I, of course I did have the singles. Uh, this is an incredible uh, record. Wilson Pickett, Atlantic Records, the exciting Wilson Pickett. Our band did Funky Broadway and Mercy Mercy and In the Midnight Hour uh, that that he wrote with Steve Cropper. It was all over this record. Incredible. So we did these, we did, I remember Funky Broadway is one of the longest songs we did when we were playing at these team dances and they were dancing. We played 10 minute version of that where we just did, we got the audience audience kind of a back and forth down to funky Broadway. Hey, hey, I feel all right. We wanted the audience to respond. Hey, we were 12 years old. You want to have that interaction. So this is a fantastic record. But at the in the time, I only had the 45s. I didn't get uh, the LP till the 70s. Of course, the San Francisco scene was just starting. The whole folk rock scene was going with Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan, of course, The Birds. And this is the first Jefferson Airplane I got, the first album, 1966. They were the first of the what would be the Psychedelic bands to get a major signing with RCA Records. They went to LA. Sidney Anderson was their singer. This was, um, she would re be replaced the next year by Grace Slick, who did Surrealistic Pillow. The next year, that would all be history. This is a fantastic record. It's no secret, it's a great song. Come up the years. Got a lot of airplay, was a mild uh, hit in the Bay Area. I'm not sure if that was played anywhere else or had much airplay anywhere else, but it was really great. It was pretty much Marty Ballon and Paul Kantner's band then, uh, but what a great folk rock album, more on the folk side of it, with great liner notes by Ralph Gleason, who was, uh, Ralph J. Gleason, who was the uh, music critic, uh, jazz critic, pop critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. Fantastic record, not psychedelic, but beautiful record. And of course, Donovan could do no wrong. His singles, uh, Sunshine Superman, which was all over the radio in 1966, produced by the great um, Mickey Most. And um, Season of the Witch is on here too, which would later uh, be a cover by a lot of psychedelic bands. The Trip, Fat Angel would be covered by Jefferson Airplane on, on, in concert at the Fillmore and the Avalon and all their shows, and they would put it on um, their 1968 live album, um, After Bathing at, not at, um, Bless His Point Little Head, right, is that right? 
Anyway, Donovan, a big fan of the 1966. Donovan had 66-67, he was like really great at pop psychedelic singles that were very radio friendly. Of course, Mamas and Papas again. Um, I saw her again, another 1966. I did not get this until 68, but this was blues psychedelic rock with East West. And of course the title track had that great sort of psychedelic Eastern Indian uh, sound, kind of raga-like of uh, Elvin Bishop and um, Mike Bloomfield's dueling, uh, dueling guitar solos. An incredible record. Again, I didn't jump on this till two years after 1966. Just wanted to show this. It's not a really great album. I wish I had Boots. I need to get a copy of Boots. But this came out in 66, Nancy Sinatra in London. Boy, what a great, great cover. Talk about, you know, the early Carnaby Street was really happening. London and San Francisco had these parallel things going on in 66, 67, which were pretty amazing. Uh, Bert Jench, I did not know this guy until the set, 1970-ish or late 69, uh, 69, 70 with Pentangle. But of course I went back uh, and got Jack Orion. Love this record. Great folky, uh, raga-ish, English folk rock, mostly folky. Beautiful record, beautiful voice. Totally influenced uh, Jimmy Page with their, in fact, you could hear on these records things that you'll swear that Jimmy Page wrote several years later. How does that happen? Of course, another Simon and Garfunkel record, Parsley Sage, I kept with these. Of course, one of my all time, my top th third favorite band, The Kinks. Their uh, 1966 output, and what's great about this, it has a um, song on here. I remember getting this record and hearing the song Dandy, and I thought they were copying the Herman's Hermits because Herman's Hermits had covered Dandy. Um, I, th I think I heard Dandy by the Herman's Hermits before I heard the Kinks original version. Uh, Sunny Afternoon, what a great song. Holiday in Waikiki. Fancy. Too much on my mind. What a beautiful, slow kind of ballad that is. But Ray Davis and Dave Davis, the Kinks, so great. Such a great band. And of course, one of the great songs also, which I, which I only got initially as a single, is Bus Stop uh, by the Hollies. One of the great harmony bands of the 1960s. And Bus Stop is another song written by Graham Goldman, who wrote, what a great string of hits he had as a songwriter. I said, For Your Love, and joined 10 C, he was start 10CC in the 70s. But um, again, these rec the Hollies were at this point more of a, a singles band, and they, you know, until maybe Eloise, and they started getting a little pop psychedelic, would they become a better album band? Um, so I didn't get these till after the fact on Sundays. I showed the single, now you can see the album, and I did get the album uh, again as a gift in 1966, Hums of the Love and Spoonful, and Summer of the City and Rain on the Roof. But again, Summer of the City, possibly the greatest single, at least the greatest summer single of 1966. Rain on the Roof, Nashville Cats. Of course, um, Loving You, very kind of country twang too. So I think, What's interesting, these two bands, and again, I'm gonna show this because it came out in 66. Now, a little thing about these two bands. I I think Eleven Spoonful and, and Buffalo Springfield have more um, in common than not, having this sort of country flair to both of them. Of course, Neil Young, Steve Steele, Richie Fure, um, Bruce Palmer and Dewey Martin. The label really didn't love Neil Young's voice, so Richie Fure would sing several of uh, Neil Young's songs, at least sing lead on them. Although I love Neil Young's voice, but um, it was a you know a little challenging. But nowadays Clancy can't even sing. Richie sings it. Richie, that's an amazing song written by Neil, written by um, Neil Young. So what's that about, right? He must have been pissed at the time, but. Okay, this is 1966. This is a 67 pressing because they threw a single onto it. For what it's worth, came out in 1967, was about the riots uh, in Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And so the 1967 pressings of this stuck 
for what it's worth on to the beginning of the song, which to me is definitely the anthem of a generation and a time and of the protest movement, and very topical today, obviously. So this opens up the record. I don't have, I think I have a reissue of, of the original pressing and the mono version obviously would be that. And um, with the mono box or the box that came out with mono and stereo, but this is a fantastic record. And again, Buffalo Springfield and was ahead of their time, but Love and Spoonful maybe too. And I think they should have carried it on, I wish, because they got this perception of a little teeny bopper, even though they weren't. But I think they could have made great albums, but John Sebastian, you know, maintained a solo career. So that's 1966, 12 year old boy in the fall, 1966 in junior high school, starting to think about girls, thinking about what that's all about, what they were all about. But being in a band, you get like little fan base, even when you're 12 years old, you'd play a battle of the bands. The silencers carried on uh, through that year into 1967, when we decided and we discovered we could pick a song like For What It's Worth, which we did play in 67. And we, we all of a sudden rehearsing one day, we were sitting in Danny's mother's living room and jamming and we realized we played that song for 20 minutes. We just started playing lead guitar and solos. And we realized what psychedelic bands like the Grateful Dead and these psychedelic bands were starting to do, these long, drawn out versions. Because on albums in 1967, you started hearing that uh, with with bands, with longer songs, with like Inagata De Vida and, uh, and the like. So um, hope you enjoyed 1966. Um, Great year for Garage Band. Interesting year for music. A transitional year from from singles to albums, from being a drummer to playing guitar in a band. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, more in the weeks to follow. Mazzy loves you. Remember when you ran away and I got on my knees and begged you not to leave because I go berserk? Well, you left me anyhow and then the days got worse and worse and now you see I've gone completely out of my mind. And they're coming to take me away, ha-ha, uh -huh. they're coming to take me away, ho ho ye ha ha to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time and I'll be happy to see those nice young men in their clean white coats and they're coming to take me away, ha uh ha! -huh. <laughs> Here we are, 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 here we are